Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with another lecture for Anatomy and Physiology 2. In this lecture, we're going to look at a special uh, part of the heart called the intrinsic conduction system. This uh, part of the heart or system has cells that conduct electrical impulses throughout the heart so that the atria and the ventricles contract in a particular sequence. The picture that you're looking at is a picture of a rabbit heart, not a human heart. And the regions in yellow are the intrinsic conduction system. This diagram or photograph picture is um, a three-dimensional reconstruction of that conduction system. And the cells that are located within the system have the ability to conduct action potentials at a particularly quick rate. And some of them are actually self-excitable. So let's look at um, a little bit about the heart before we talk about the intrinsic conduction system. And just recall that the heart has two different types of cardiocytes. One type of cardiocyte is called a contractile cardiocyte. Truthfully, the heart's made up mainly of these types of cells, the, so they're the most numerous. And they're the ones that contract and um, cause blood pressure and therefore the flow of blood. The conductive cardiocytes, the other type of um, cardiocyte or cell in the heart, is specialized for electrical conduction, like neurons are specialized. So these conductive cardiocytes make up the intrinsic conduction system. And some of them are able to generate electrical impulses without the input from the nervous system. The rest of the cells in the intrinsic conduction system propagate action potentials and then stimulate the contractile cells to contract. So now we'll actually name the different parts of this intrinsic conduction system. First, we have um, the sinoatrial node, which is in the superior region of the right atrium. And then the second region is called the atrioventricular node, also present in the right atrium, but much more inferior. Then we have the um, bundle of cells. It's called the AV bundle or the atrioventricular bundle. Sometimes it's called the bundle of Hiss, but that's kind of an older name. This bundle um, emits two branches a right branch and a left branch that travel within the interventricular septum until reaching the apex of the heart and then continue superiorly in the um, peripheral wall of the ventricle. These bundle branches give off even smaller extensions called Purkinje fibers, which then innervate um, and spread an impulse to the contractile cells of the ventricle. So before we talk about how the electrical conduction uh, system works, or the intrinsic conduction system works, to excite cardiac contractile cells, let's look at what we remember from skeletal muscle contraction. Recall that skeletal muscles must be excited by neurons in order to contract. So here we have in the left box, we have the end of an axon, the axon terminal of a neuron that releases neurotransmitter. And this neurotransmitter then binds to a receptor on the skeletal muscle cell. That's going to cause the inside of the cell to become more positive because sodium ions will move through this channel 
and cause the depolarization event of the contractile skeletal muscle cell. When enough sodium has entered the inside of the muscle cell, an action potential is generated, and recall that one action potential initiates the next one, and then that one is a stimulus for the next action potential. And so you get a series of action potentials traveling along the membrane of the skeletal muscle cell and then going in the transverse tubules, eventually depolarizing rather deeply inside of the cell. And of course, sodium's going in the whole time to the inside of the cell. And that causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. So the whole purpose in excitation by a neuron, the inside of the cell becoming positive, is to get this calcium released into the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell. Because if you recall, calcium is required in order for the muscle contraction to, to occur. For a cross bridge to form between the myosin heads and the actin filaments, calcium has to be present so that the binding sites are exposed. Things are somewhat similar in cardiac muscle tissue, um, but the difference is that you don't have a neuron, right? You have this SA node or sinoatrial node, part of the intrinsic conduction system that spontaneously depolarizes. So the cells within this location are considered to be self-excitable. No neural stimulation is required, and they depolarize and produce action potentials. Then the action potentials are propagated or conducted um, throughout the atrial contractile tissue, also hitting this AV node, and the AV node depolarizes and produces an action potential. And then that action potential stimulates another one in the AV bundle. And action potentials then are propagated along the AV bundle, also then to the two bundle branches, and finally to the Purkinje fibers in the wall of the peripheral wall of the ventricles. Ultimately, those Purkinje fibers will cause the contractile cells to become depolarized. Calcium will be released when they're depolarized, and that will allow contraction of the heart muscle. So the sequence of excitation within this intrinsic conduction system sequence meaning the sequence or conduction of an electrical impulse starts with the SA node and then action potentials are propagated throughout the atrium both the left atrium and the right atrium as well as to the AV node and then through the AV bundle the bundle branches which kind of turn superiorly here and then the Purkinje fibers. The last thing that happens, of course, is that the myocardium is excited, and so the ventricles will contract. So the rate of depolarization is going to be dictated by the sinoatrial node. We, that usually happens, the depolarization of the sinoatrial nodes usually happens um, at about a rate of 75 to 80, causing 75 to 80 beats per minute of the heart. So the way that the SA node depolarizes causes the whole ventricular heart rate of 75 to 80 beats per minute. This is called the sinus rhythm. Now this sinus rhythm can be altered by the autonomic nervous system. And while 60 to 100 beats per minute, that heart rate is normal, 
it can speed up or slow down based on input from the sympathetic nervous system, which would cause tachycardia, or the parasympathetic nervous system, which would cause bradycardia or a slow heart rate. So the SA node produces these action potentials truthfully at a rate of about 100 times per minute. But I just said that the heart rate is between 75 and 80. So what's the difference? Why does the SA node have this ability to cause, you know, fast excitation 100 times a minute, but yet the heart only contracts like 80 times a minute? That's due to the fact that there's continual parasympathetic input to the sinoatrial node. So it's almost always slowed down to 70 to 80 beats per minute. So now we're going to look at the actual action potentials, a graph of them that um, the SA node produces, and compare those with the action potentials that you've already learned about in a neuron. So the diagram on the left shows two action potentials occurring in a cell of the SA node. And on the right is an action potential of the neuron. Notice that there's some differences. Well, first I've got two on the left and only one action potential on the right. But let's look at the details, actually. So the action potential in the SA node, the maximum depolarization that is achieved at the peak here is, a zero, is zero millivolts. That's lower than what you see in a neuron. In a neuron, the action potential goes all the way up to positive 35 millivolts. So that's one difference. The second difference between an SA node and a neuron is that the threshold depolarization is slightly different. If you recall in a neuron, it's about negative 55. To get an action potential, you have to have depolarization from negative 70 up to negative 55. But in an SA node, you go from negative 60, which is the resting membrane, up to negative 40. So the threshold level for an action potential to occur is different in an SA node cell. But what's really the most important and what gives the SA node its um, ability to be self-excitable without neural input is this resting membrane potential. Not only is the resting membrane potential higher than what we see in neurons, but it's also unstable, meaning the SA node cell spends very little time at the resting membrane potential. This negative 60 happens for the briefest of milliseconds, and that's because there are always channels open, sodium channels, allowing sodium to leak into the cell. So while there is a repolarization event in this action potential, taking the SA cell back down to a resting membrane potential, it doesn't stay there very long. So that's what's different. So in addition to the fact that the resting membrane potential um, of an SA node cell is unstable because of the continual influx of sodium. We also see another difference, a couple of other differences in the action potential. Like in a neuron, this depolarization threshold is going to open more sodium channels. And so you'll get even more of an influx of sodium into the SA node cell. But another kind of channel is also opened, and that's calcium channels. So this rapid depolarization event that happens, uh, almost completely vertical line or changes in depolarization, is due to the influx of both sodium 
and calcium. So sodium and calcium flow into the SA node cell until the inside of the cell reaches zero millivolts. At that point, the sodium and calcium channels close, but voltage potassium channels open, or voltage um, regulated potassium channels open. This is just like in the neuron. And so now you have potassium leaving the cell. So potassium efflux occurs. And since a positive ion is leaving the SA node cell, the inside of the cell becomes steadily more negative, going all the way down to negative 60 millivolts. And as I mentioned, it just stays there briefly because there's always, all the way through this action potential, there's always a little bit of sodium coming in due to these special sodium channels that are always open. So the inflow of the sodium due to those channels is sometimes called the funny current to distinguish it from the sodium that goes in after threshold. But, but you really don't have to know about the funny current. So just to reiterate, the SA node cell allows or is permeable to sodium, and so it allows sodium to slowly enter the cell. That means the cell is going to rise it's in potential, it will become more positive, and at threshold negative 40, then both calcium and some other sodium channels open. And so calcium and sodium both go into the cell causing rapid depolarization all the way up to about zero millivolts. At zero millivolts, these special sodium channels and calcium channels will close, but potassium channels will open and potassium is going to leave the cell causing repolarization all the way down to resting. So the SA node is typically the pacemaker of the cell. But if for some reason um, the SA node is not functional for whatever reason, a heart block or some kind of um, a heart attack or something like that, the AV node can take over because it also has some self-excitable cells. So here's the, the AV node. And the AV node cells produce action potentials at an intrinsic rate of about 40 to 50 times per minute. So that means the heart's going to beat a lot slower if it's the AV node that's um, controlling excitation of the heart. But normally it's the SA node that depolarizes and sets the rhythm. Now, as the SA node sets the rhythm, it sends out electrical signals to the myocardium of this right atrium. And an electrical signal then goes through the interatrial septum over to the left atrium. And so you get some contraction of the, the atrial myocardium. What also happens during this time is the AV node receives an action potential and is stimulated to propagate an action potential to the AV bundle. But what's interesting is that action potentials move slower or are propagated slower um, through the multiple cells to the AV bundle. Now, it's important for this electrical conduction to kind of slow down at the AV node for a couple of reasons. It causes a delay so that the signal doesn't reach the bundle, bundle branches, and eventually the Purkinje fibers and ventricular myocardium until the atria are done contracting. What this does is it gives the ventricles time to fill 
before they're depolarized and contract. Now, I mentioned that the electrical conduction travels through the myocardium or contractile cells as well as through the intrinsic conduction system. And there's special features of the atrial muscle tissue or myocardium that allows this to happen very quickly so that the left atrium and the right atrium are excited and contract almost simultaneously, essentially simultaneously. And what the feature is that allows this um, speedy conduction and then contraction um, is the presence of gap junctions between cells. And there's a thin septum between the two atrium as well. So these gap junctions are, you could think of them as channels, but they're kind of openings or connections between two cells that enable ions to move between cells. So here's a picture of uh, myocardiocytes that are contractile. And this blue cell right here is currently um, depolarized on the inside. <clears throat> and so there are action potentials occurring in sequence and propagated all the way down to the end of it. Well, <clears throat> now we know that it's sodium and calcium that's causing the depolarization event. And that sodium and that calcium can just go through a gap junction to the next cell and cause this cell B to then be depolarized and produce action potentials very quickly. And um, again, the ions will travel through these gap junctions. So it's the presence of gap junctions that makes the electrical conduction spread quickly throughout the atrial muscle tissue. Okay, so this intrinsic conduction system is essential to ensure that we have a proper sequence of the chambers depolarizing and then contracting. We first need both atria to contract, and then we need both ventricles to contract. Now, imagine if, which kind of makes sense when I tell you this, I think it'll make sense. Imagine if the electrical conduction went from the SA node inferiorly through the myocardium and directly to the cells of the ventricle you would have contraction in that sequence as well. So first the top of the atrium would contract and then the middle of the atrium would contract and then the bottom of it and then the top of the ventricle and then the middle of the ventricle, etc. Well, we don't want that to happen because we don't want the ventricle to receive the signal that quickly. I've already described how it, it slows down at the AV node. We need it to, to the conduction of the electrical impulse to actually slow down more than that so that the, the ventricles have time to fill. And so another um, feature of the heart, anatomical feature of the heart, that helps with this is called the cardiac skeleton. It prevents the depolarization or electrical conduction from directly spreading from the atria to the ventricles. And what the cardiac skeleton is, is just connective tissue. It's not bone, it's fibrous connective tissue. And it's located in between the atria and the ventricles. And it's kind of these two rings here. What I think is the coolest thing about how the electrical conduction system works, well, first, I guess, is that it's self-excitable and the heart doesn't need any neural input because the SA node, as well as the AV node, can spontaneously depolarize. 
right? So the muscle tissue will eventually be excited just because of these two nodes in the heart. And so the heart will continue to contract. As long as there's calcium around and ATP around, the heart will beat. But what I was going to say that I think is the coolest thing is that the, the uh, pattern of excitation and contraction really complements the direction that we want blood to flow in the heart. So remember the two atria contract first and they both send blood inferiorly through the AV valves into the ventricles. Well notice that the electrical stimulation or excitation begins superiorly and moves inferiorly. That means contraction will as well. And so you'll have the top of the atria squeezing the blood inferiorly all the way, the con contraction will continue all the way down the atria and squeeze that last little bit of blood out of the atria into the ventricles. Then notice that <clears throat> because of the pattern of excitation through the AV bundle and the bundle branches and then up through the Purkinje fibers, we first get excitation of muscle tissue in the ventricles very inferiorly. So excitation begins down here where there's some Purkinje cells at the apex of the heart. So muscle tissue in the apex of the heart will be the first to contract. And then excitation is going to spread superiorly, as will contraction, squeezing the blood superiorly, which seems weird in a way, but that's exactly the way we want it to go. We want it to go in the opposite direction because that's where the outlet from the ventricles is located. The aorta, the opening to the aorta, is at the top of the ventricle, and taken off of this picture is the opening to the the pulmonary artery, which would be at the top of the right ventricle there. So I think that's what's really cool about the heart. So that's all for the intrinsic conduction system. Thank you for listening.